So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. All right, so if you have built, tried to build on the sand of the sea, and you've taken a wrong standpoint, you've taken either the standpoint of theology, false theology, or you've taken the standpoint of medicine, then you get the results of that. You get that false pattern. You get labeled with a false pattern, don't you? You get that 666 in your forehead. You, you have identified yourself with something other than God, something other than your elders. And so what's the answer to that? You have to go to your elders, don't you? How do you get there? Well, you go and take that standpoint of the lamb. You return to your Christ consciousness. You take the standpoint of the Christ consciousness. That's a lamb standing on Mount Zion. It's a lamb that stands on the whole calculus of power and operation. And that lamb has with it the 144,000. It has the true sense of the demonstration of manhood, of what man is, of what you are. And that true manhood is patterned with the Father's name. The Father's name is written in their foreheads. And that standpoint hears a new song. It doesn't hear the old song, the old songs that the world hears, the old songs of the theologians and the preachers and the evangelists and the old songs about what Jesus did and how we must be good Christians and the old songs of, of the medical field. Oh, you have this, you can't be cured of that. That's incurable. You'll never be free of that or you'll have to do this and this and this for the rest of your life. Those old songs are out because you get the new song of scientific Christianity of one principle with those four beasts, one throne with four beasts and those elders. And so you have to go to your elders. Go to your first elder. You know what your first elder is? What is your first elder? What is God? Yes. It's the very first question. You see? In recapitulation. So that's where the answer begins. What is God? Well, God is incorporeal, divine, supreme, infinite. Mind, spirit, soul, principle, life, truth, and love. Next elder. Well, are these, are these synonymous? Uh, yes, they are, and uh, in a certain way they are, yeah. Well, are there any other uh, gods or principles? No, there are no. So you go to your elders, and you're on a completely different foundation than the sand of the sea. And then something starts to happen. Something really happens then. The judgment day of error is with you. You get the judgment day. 
And so we go on and we see that we have the Christianity order coming in now to answer the uh, whole proposition of those two beasts and to set forth what is going to happen to error, how error will be judged. And we get angels, angels, angels coming. Angels coming out of that consciousness of scientific metaphysics. So it says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, preaching the everlasting gospel. Now we have the Christianity order. We're at the point of principle. We're going to see uh, how error is going to be judged, and then we will see that it is judged. But first we're going to see how it will be judged. And principle says there is first an announcement of the judgment that comes from the everlasting gospel. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven preaching the everlasting gospel. You see the good news that there is a principle to deal with this problem of the two beasts. A principle to deal with the claim that there is any other so-called principle that you could ever have mistakenly based yourself on. And principle is going to interpret everything. It's the principle of the universe. And then we come to mind. Another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city is fallen. The sense that material knowledge is nothing, has nothing to it. Then soul, the third angel, saying, if any man worships the beast and receives the mark of his name, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. That the fires of soul are going to burn up all that tendency within us to turn to another principle, to go to any other principle but the principle of scientific metaphysics. That man is actually incapable of sin, that he's not going to be allowed to sin, not going to be allowed to deviate from that principle. And then spirit, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, dying to the things of matter, dying to the things of the flesh. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, spirit, and upon the cloud one that sat like unto the Son of Man, and in his hand a sharp sickle. That sickle to, of spirit to, to separate the purity of spirit, blessing everything through the order of spirit. And then life, and another angel came out of the temple. You hear it's just one angel after another after another, <coughs> crying, thrust in the sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Everything is ripe for the turning over of the false principles, the false standpoints, and bringing everything back to that principle of Christianity. So life reaps now the fullness of life. Then truth and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. You see, it's like the sword of spirit and truth. Here we get the sickle of spirit and the sickle of truth. And love. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over the fire. Power over the claim of fear. Don't fear. 
You have nothing to fear. Love will bring the wrath of God. In other words, love will bring the self-destruction of error. That's what the wrath of God is. The operation of truth, truth operating as the self-destruction of error. And thrust in the sharp sickle, for the grapes are fully ripe, and gather the wine, the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Here it's a, an active, uh, everything is on the move now to bring about the resolution of error through the operation of truth. And the winepress was trodden without the city, it was trodden outside of the city, not within the city. And that brings us to the uh, close of the fourth vision and into the fifth vision of soul, which is the pouring out of the seven vials of wrath, is the annihilation of error. So again, the end of the uh, fourth vision was that there was the gathering of the vine of the earth, casting it into the uh, wine press of the wrath of God, that it was trodden outside of the city. And so we come to the fifth vision. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues filled with the wrath of God. So they bring now this uh, self-destruction of error. It's a symbol for the, the seven, the uh, seven numerals dealing with the seven uh, counterfeits of those numerals. The ideas of the seven dealing with the counterfeits of the ideas of the seven, of ideas annihilating illusions. Isn't that Christianity? And they which had begotten a victory, had gotten a victory over the beast and his image and his mark and over the number of his name, 666, sing a song. Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. And the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. Here we have the uh, temple now opening again in heaven. Remember in that seventh um, trumpet we had that, the opening of the temple, but we had the... Uh, showing forth of the Ark of the Testament. We don't have that here. That was a vision for the 7,000 year period, but we are uh, looking into the heart of the uh, 6,000 year period of the operation now of scientific metaphysics. So the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. You see, it's the dealing of truth with error. I mean, the dealing that truth deals with error. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. So you have the, the um, sense of that temple being filled with the smoke of the glory of God. It uh, means the presence of God, the operation of God, the power of God. It's the um, sense of how truth works to analyze, uncover, and annihilate error through the operation of the 
Christ's translation. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Gives you a sense of what we see in that uh, uh, Christ translation. No man was able to enter into the temple. You really don't have the appearing of the true man until the third degree when um, those seven plagues have been dealt with, when depravity has been dealt with and exchanged and retranslated. So there is that translation of mortal mind back into mind itself. Then in chapter 16, the handling of evil from the standpoint of perfection. It's given in the inverted word order. A great voice out of the temple said to the seven angels, pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And so we have that handling of evil from the point of perfection given in the inverted word order. Um, you probably know the story of John Dorley of how he himself came to the um, point in his own development of feeling that he couldn't always work from mind to love anymore. That he was so filled with the fullness of that order from mind to love that he felt he had to come out from love. And that that was something that came upon him in his own development before he ever found the proof of it in the Bible. It was only later that he discovered in Revelation that that order exists, that it is a, a um, system intrinsic order. Apparently that was in the 1930s or the mid-30s that he already began to feel the, uh, the fullness, the perfection of that word and so could handle evil from the standpoint of perfection. And that's what we see here in this uh, part of Revelation. It begins with love. Uh, the symbols are not easy. We'll just quickly go over them. So handling evil from the point of perfection is what enables us to enter the temple. Love handles fear and hate. And that's symbolized in the story by a grievous sore. Truth handles the belief of mortal manhood, the blood of a dead man. Life handles mortality and persecution, that the rivers became blood. Principle handles adherence to false systems upon the sun. Soul handles the pains of the material senses. That was symbolized by the seat of the beast as the opposite of soul. That spirit handles dualism and crisis. The Euphrates dried up and the symbol of Armageddon. And mind handles the manifold beliefs of mortal mind. The cities of the nations fell and there was a great hail. So it's a symbol for the fact that to come out from perfection is the highest sense of handling evil in the word on the level of Christian science. 
coming out from perfection judges everything scientifically will judge everything that is against the one city the true city it is clearing away now we see these chapters are beginning to clear away everything that would be against that heavenly city that city four square within consciousness that is going to come it's clearing away the false city for the new heaven and the new earth and we are uh, reaching the conclusion of the Michael method We're coming to that conclusion and its result you see will be seen to be the same as the Gabriel method the result of both is that we reach the holy city the city four square but with the consciousness of love everything is instantaneous with the consciousness of love the time sense is out of it but if we're not at the point of love then we have truth and we can still get to love we can still arrive at love so that brings us to um, uh, chapter 17 we said that we were clearing everything away now from that one city and now we're going to get right to the root of the opposite of that one city the opposite of that city four square is Babylon Babylon the judgment of Babylon has to come the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters that's Babylon sometimes referred to in the text as the Babylonian woman again you know that that's the opposite of the city four square standing for material science here it is the false sense of science science not yet seen to be divine science small s taken as a principle per se you see that's the great whore so now we have the uh, the layout um, of the story taking on a new structure as science as the word science as the Christ science as Christianity and science as science so we begin with science as the word in chapter 17 that that material knowledge Babylon is enmity against the scientific idea against the lamb and so we have here soul and life as the uh, main tones as we know science as the word is soul and life the numerals of infinity the seven synonymous terms that are going to deal now with uh, this falsity of the Babylonian woman material science with its manifold beliefs it says that um, she was sitting upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy and having seven heads now you see how the seven synonymous terms or the numerals of infinity have to deal with those seven heads also in the story are seven mountains seven kings all being handled by soul and life those numerals of infinity and upon uh, the forehead a name written mystery hmm. physical science is a mystery if you don't interpret it from the standpoint of divine science 
Upon the forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Can you see that everything's a matter of interpretation? Huh? Because that's the physical sciences if we don't see, if we don't see them really as the shadowing forth of divine science. We don't see them from the standpoint of the categories of being. And then we come to science as the Christ, that the Christ idea destroys with great power mortal mind with all its manifestations. Truth and spirit. You hear where we are in the, in the candlestick order, in the same order that that uh, St. John used in uh, his gospel. We've just had science as the word. We've seen how those numerals of infinity have to deal with the counterfeits of the seven. Now we are at the point of truth and spirit, the calculus, the divine infinite calculus. And it says there, Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen in one hour. Hmm? Could you not watch with me one hour? That, that one hour is dynamic. That one hour has the calculus in it. It can overturn the foundation of error. It can overturn that great and mighty city and give place to the city four square. And in one hour is thy judgment come. In that one question, in the answer to that one question, what is God? In one hour so great riches is come to naught. See? In one hour is she made desolate. And how was she brought to naught? with a great mill stone. You hear the calculus? Truth and spirit, the calculus. With a great millstone, Babylon is destroyed. And a mighty angel took up a stone, a great millstone, a great calculus, and cast it into the sea. And thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So when we take the standpoint of science, divine science, divine science that is the one science, then that false sense of science, that mysterious sense, that material sense of science is just uh, disappearing, being resolved into its nothingness through the calculus.